Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and today we have another programme in this new series we started called Consciousness and Sustainability. We're just investigating where that leads and our guest today is Tony Wright. Hi Hello, Tony. Ian. And Tony's written a book called Left in the Dark which I got hold of a copy of uh, a couple of months ago and I really found a very fascinating read and we're going to find out more about Tony, why he wrote the book and of course what the book is all about. So Tony, you got to this stage many years ago in your mid-twenties where you felt that things didn't quite add up. So what, what happened there? Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it really was um, a sort of an evolving process where I'd, I'd always had a, a rather sceptical view of anything that wasn't testable, provable, and I, I was in, involved in a, a sort of an academic learning process. Um, I was involved in plant sciences, genetics and molecular biology and so on. Um, and I could see quite early on that some of the things that I was being taught and parts of the syllabus didn't quite make sense to me, the way humans were living their lives and the science behind it all. Um, and also I, I had a circle of friends, uh, well a small number of friends who were interested in things that up to up to that time I would have had very little interest in being very skeptical about sort of um, interest in spirituality shamanism this kind of thing um, but eventually I got to a point where I could see maybe these things you know they, they will make sense and uh, I, I, I really set out to investigate um, partly through a process of self-experimentation and the further I got with that the more intrigued I got and uh, ended up becoming somewhat obsessed by getting to the bottom of these things. So what kind of experimentation did you do? Uh, well, well, to start with, um, uh, I was very interested in um, theories of evolution and it seemed to make sense on the, on the sort of surface of it. However, I, I could see where it didn't seem to be applied to humans, um, despite the sort of the, the classic Darwinian idea that we evolved from primates and um, which I didn't have a problem with at all. Um, but I was particularly interested in the way we, um, uh, we, we sort of constructed ourselves, and I'm, I'm sort of using engineering terminology here, the, the materials that we use to build one of the most complex neural systems that, that is known to science. Um, it was out with the models used for primates. It was as if we were somehow, we had completely different rules, and um, I became aware partly through a friend, that um, the materials that we were using were being heated in air, sort of oxidised heavily, and then we were building the most complex neural system we knew out of them. And from my limited academic studies, it didn't make any sense. So, that I mean, that was one quite solid early platform that I pondered for some while, and I thought, well, it's not too difficult to do some self-experimentation. I, I did a little bit of reading around and I tried to approximate, I changed my diet, basically, and tried to approximate, I guess, the biochemistry of what I, I felt. A, a so what was your diet before and what did you change it to? Um, it, it was, I, I guess, fairly average for a, a sort of Western European diet. It was not particularly healthy, not particularly unhealthy, sort of cooked vegetables and some cooked meat and rarely some sort of salad and a bit of fruit now and again. Um, and I, I tried to change that to a, exclusively a mixture of fruit, leaves and nuts, the things that I was, un understood that, that primates primarily ate. Um, that was, I, I was particularly interested in the biochemistry and how that, that okay. would affect you know, the, the So function. when you say primates, what do you mean by that? Um, mostly our, our sort of closest relatives, as, as is currently understood, the sort of forest-dwelling apes. Um, okay. orangutans, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, um, and, and possibly related to some of our extinct relatives as well and what, what they may have been eating. And why did you think that diet was better than your previous diet? What, what kind of drew <clears throat> you there? Well, I, I think it was initially a, a limited understanding of how delicate some of these plant molecules are and if they were an integral part of biological evolution for tens of millions of years, that's very, very long time scales. Um, and then they were being taken out of the realms of biology and into chemistry, and we were the only species doing that voluntarily. 
uh, well, that's an interesting experiment. It's presumed not to make any difference. It's presumed that, well, you can put anything in and you can still build the most complex neural system that we know and it, it'll work fine. So I thought, well, maybe there's something to look at here. So you felt that we'd lost our way with our diet and we changed our diet and that was to our detriment. Yes, yeah, and in, in at that time, in a very simplistic sense, a sort of uh, a classic, you are what you eat. Well, if 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 we built ourselves from um, sort of fruits and vegetables for eons, and then suddenly we weren't, in an engineering sort of sense, that I'd expect there to be a change. If you build something differently, it usually works differently. So yes, I felt there'd been a change, and it may well be detrimental. On the other hand, we can say that man has evolved so much in that time, I don't know what that time frame is, 100,000, 200,000 years or whatever, it's incredible how we've evolved in terms of our ability to do so many things. Um, yeah, although I'd, I'd immediately question how we categorise and qualify, qualify evolution in a technological or industrial sense. I mean, yes, the, the, there is clearly, humans do clearly possess a genius, which interests me. But if you look at how we apply that and where it's actually led us in terms of our quality of life and what we've done with that technology, to see those things as independently, it doesn't work for me. The, you know, most, most of our effort goes into building machines to kill each other. And yes, they're phenomenally advanced, but look what we do with it. So we've got this tremendous ability, but we're using it the wrong way, you're saying? Um, that's part of it. I mean, I'm, t I'm talking about the genesis of my interest. Um, yes, it did evolve, yes. you know, so I was starting with quite basic ideas. And as I say, it was relatively easy to, to change some of those inputs and just see what happened. Because I know one of the things you talk about beginning your book, which is quite fascinating, is you experimented with sleep deprivation for a time. And that was around the <coughs> mid 90s. Yeah, that came a little bit later. Um, <coughs> as I said, I, I made this change in in diet or the building materials um, without any particular agenda. It was just a curiosity, really. Um, and within about two to three years, I, I began to notice some differences, not, not anything too profound, but enough to keep me curious. Uh, the way my mind seemed to work seemed to be sharper. I seemed to be able to see information differently. It's very difficult to define, but it felt different anyway. Um, and that by that time, I'd become more interested in some of these traditions that perhaps a few years earlier I'd have been quite sceptical or just not interested in the sort of what, what, I'd, what I'd later come to term as the sort of mystical traditions or the, the, the sort of ancient approaches to altered states of consciousness. Um, I began to see them as a sort of, well, is, is there a what I call a scientific basis to that rather than it just being some esoteric nonsense as I might have described it at one time. Um, and uh, I think it was be around about 1995, um, I'd pondered many of the techniques that I'd heard about or read about, um, and one in particular, for various reasons, came to the surface. It was uh, sleep deprivation or intentionally staying awake, and I'd read about it in, I think, Vision Quest, and it's part of the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the earliest written texts there are, and so on. And I'd noticed when I got quite enthusiastic about what I was doing, I'd end up being up four, five, six in the morning and feeling, if anything, more insightful and more intrigued by what I was, you know, sort of pondering. And it, it struck me almost intuitively that, yeah, there's something interesting about human sleep, um, from sleepwalking, for example, to the literature where people have come up with astounding breakthroughs either in their dreams or in the early early hours when they're sort of tired and yet some th flash of inspiration will emerge unexpectedly. Um, so again, it, it, it struck me as a very easy thing to test. It's not, you know, there's, there's no prohibition about keeping yourself awake. Um, and I was also aware that um, because of the three or four years I'd changed my diet by that time, it would be an interesting combination, probably quite unique or relatively unique anyway. And when you stayed awake for several days, which I know you've done because you write about in the book, what kind of effect did you find then? Um, uh, utterly fascinating. I mean, it, it really turned... Uh, it was becoming... Uh, I was becoming increasingly intrigued by these big unanswered questions. Um, but I, I think I retained a degree of 
um, I wouldn't say a healthy scepticism. Um, however, the first experiment I did, which I think was it was only about three days, three or four, three and a half days maybe, um, there were a number of experiences um, that convinced me that this was something profoundly interesting and really um, shaped the rest of the, the sort of following ten years. So what happened? What were the experiences? Um, well, t to begin with, I, 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 um, I, I'd probably been awake maybe about two days. I'd, I'd uh, arranged with a friend to go to a conference on consciousness. I think it was in Cambridge, uh, it would be 1995. And by that time, I, that was a sort of umbrella term for the things I was becoming interested in. I thought, well, I'll go along and see what's going on in the world of consciousness and speak to all the people who know all about this thing. Uh, and I'll use that as a sort of an experiment to stay awake for the, the, the duration of the conference. Um, booked into a youth hostel and I had a friend sort of keeping an eye on me to make sure I, you know, I'd read you, you could end up sending yourself mad or dying a horrible <laughs> death or whatever. Yeah. I, I, I was sensible enough to say, well, look, you know, keep an eye on me. And if, I, if I'm claiming I'm fine, but clearly I'm not, then um, at least remind me that this could could end up in a difficult situation. So anyway, I stayed awake, um, and one of the things I noticed was how easy it was. Uh, I felt perfectly fine, and I was checking in with my friend who knew me well enough to say, well, look, you know, you're, you're struggling or you're, you're not really coherent, and quite the opposite. He was also quite surprised. So that was interesting in itself. Um, and then I think by the third day, we'd ended up back at a house, and I'd... I'd uh, sat down for a little while and w between us we pieced we think we pieced together what happened where I had fallen asleep for maybe five to ten minutes and um, I'd I had awoken in a, a state I didn't recognize at all um, quite bewildering and quite perplexing although I didn't have any means to describe it real time it was it was a bewildering experience rather than I wasn't narrating it to myself as I might do now um, and I think the best way I can describe it, it, it had elements, partly little bits I'd read before and then what I've subsequently read. It sort of had elements of a classic mystical experience where there was a sort of profoundly different sense of self and different experience of self um, and involved elements of uh, quite intense euphoria and a, a sense of knowing without really being able to rationalize it, a sort of different way of seeing myself in the world. Um, I mean, it's not an experience I tend to talk about. I still feel a little bit, well, how, how do you present this in a way that makes sense? But it was certainly very powerful in that it, it transformed my interest into a, a, a quest almost to unravel this. Well, what happened? How did I induce this? And, oh, well, all, do you, all you have to do is stay awake. Well, it turned out not to be that easy. But that was certainly the, the start of a major investigation on my part. Because you go on to explain in the book that you felt um, during that experience that your left hand side of the brain had fallen asleep mm. and your right hand side of the brain was still awake. Yeah. Then why don't you just explain briefly the difference between the left and the right hand side of the brain for people that aren't fully familiar with that? <clears throat> Um, well, the, 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 the standard thinking, which I, I think is, is partly correct, is that the the left side of the brain is typically dominant in, in everybody by degrees um, and it's it's considered to be the side of the brain that gives us um, our dominant sense of self, rational thought, ability to formulate concepts, um, speech, very left brain dominant um, and generally presumed certainly by the academic community and I, I am generalizing to be the sort of product of an advanced adaptive trait it somehow brought us to where we are and it's the clever um, the clever side of us it's that's um, allowed us to evolve civilization and so on and so forth and then the right side of the brain is generally seen as a little bit mysterious um, associated with creativity artistic ability music and so on um, creative insights perhaps um, and also, even within the neurological literature, it's tended, uh, it's presumed to be more in touch with reality, for example. That's, that's something that's been sort of experimented with. Whereas the left side, again, we talk about concepts. 
and it's often portrayed as the concepts are, you know, that's, that's a good idea that, that we approximate reality. So those, those are the two sort of halves of the coin, really. So the right-hand side of the brain tends to see the bigger picture of life mm. as such and how we're all connected and... Yeah, it sort of experiences reality directly, um, whereas the left side of the brain invents approximations of reality. Um, and that, that's, that immediately fascinates me because um, there's immediately a paradox that if the left side of the brain is in charge, which is what, what all the literature would suggest and a handedness would suggest, it's, it's making these assumptions and um, coming to the conclusions about its own superiority because it's in charge, so it's the one doing the assessment, if you like. And there's immediately, I think, something dangerous in that. So is your left hand side of the brain in charge? Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, it's, it is. It's in yeah, charge it's 99% of the time. So it happens to all of us. Yeah, it's, I think it's endemic in humans. It's, it's the normal state of affairs. Right. It does vary, I think. Um, there's degrees of dominance, but yes, it's, it's in charge. So what happened in that time of not sleeping was you managed to experience what it was like for the left hand side of the brain to lose its dominance and you were more living with the right hand side of the brain. In a word, um, yes. I mean, very. Yeah. very I think very briefly. I think I, I think I was a little bit lucky. I was out of beginner's luck, if you like. I was using a what is, after all, an ancient technique. There's nothing new in intentionally staying awake to reach altered states of consciousness. Um, and I think the combination of what I was considering to be a natural diet, which really is the biochemistry of our evolution, rather than just the food we eat. Um, and yeah, I think I had a lucky break. I think um, I managed, partly by the intentional staying awake and possibly by a bit of luck. Um, I'm pretty convinced the left side of my brain basically was tired and went to sleep. Yes. And the right side of my brain took the opportunity and had a brief peep out of the window, if you like. Yes. But that was enough. It was so radically different that although it was a short period, maybe 20 minutes at most, it um, transformed everything I ever thought I knew forever basically can we survive without the left without using the left hand side of the brain <clears throat> um i i'd have to provide my context around how i see the left and right in an yeah. evolutionary sense in that um most of the literature you you'll currently read on left right side of the brain talks about perhaps too much left brain dominance finding some way to rebalance these things working together would be a good idea and, and i can totally understand that um, what I actually think has happened is we have um, the left hand. The left hand side of the brain is actually a, a damaged version of the right side of the brain, which is quite a different way of looking at it's it. It's damaged. Mm. It's, okay. it's, um, it's malfunctioning. It, it doesn't fully develop its abilities. It's. Uh, I mean, we can get into the detail in a bit, but it's. Yeah. It basically its its development is retarded. It doesn't fully achieve its potential, and yet paradoxically it takes control. And whereas the right hand